But good morning. Good to see everybody here. Heard some really good things about uh, Aaron's uh, lesson last week, uh, most encouraging. So, you know, I really appreciate Aaron filling the uh, pulpit for me last week while my son and I uh, rode our scooters to the top of Pikes Peak. And, um, you know, if you've ever done any kind of research on that, uh, and, they, and they talk about the donuts above 14,000 feet, uh, they are very well worth $4 each. And so anyhow, uh, that was, it was just a really good, really good time. Um, we're continuing our series through the first Corinthian letter. We're going to be in chapter 10. And <clears throat> just by way of some brief introduction here, uh, chapters 8, 9, and 10 really kind of go together because chapter 8 uh, introduces the problem of idolatry that was going on in this particular area. And uh, chapter 10, it, it, it kind of ends that section. And I've titled this, you know, fighting off or fending off the problem of idolatry. How do we deal with it, you know? And this chapter tells us uh, some really good things about how to do that. And so because we have so much to cover here, I think we should just go ahead and uh, and get right into it as we look at three, uh, I broke this down into three uh, sections. First of all, we have an Old Testament example. We have some New Testament incentive. And then the last point that we will cover is one that talks about the current or the present glorification of God <clears throat> that really uh, really uh, is important. So let's read the first 13 verses together. I hope you have your Bibles open. Let's begin. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized in Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now, these things happened as examples for us that we should not crave evil things <clears throat> as they also craved. And do not be idolaters uh, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Uh, the word play here can be translated dance, nor let us act immorally as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the uh, destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so this section ends with verses 12 and 13, reading, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, uh, but, with, uh, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. So in the first four verses here, there, there are blessings that uh, all can enjoy. And it's important that I mention all, because in these four verses, the word all is mentioned five specific times. He says, all were baptized, all were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. They were all involved in the blessings that God was sharing with them. Now, <clears throat> we, I have a number of Old Testament passages uh, that we could turn to to point some of these things out regarding the the cloud. You know, when uh, God was leading them through the wilderness by uh, day, there was that pillar of cloud uh, that led them. They were under that pillar of cloud. At night, the pillar of cloud became a pillar of fire. That way they had their headlights, as it were, so they wouldn't trip and fall and hurt themselves. And so they would stay uh, stay underneath that protection of God. And there also, <clears throat> Paul uses the term baptized. They were basically immersed uh, in this. And um, <clears throat> the illustration there, I think, is very strong. 
Uh, I don't r normally read large or long quotes, but I do have one that I think fits real well because we look at this idea here uh, in Scripture where it says they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. How in the world were they baptized into Moses? Well, there was what was Moses doing? Moses was God's mouthpiece, as it were. He was instructing them. He was teaching them. They were baptized into the truths that Moses was giving to God's children. And uh, this quote um, from uh, when I was in school there, that uh, it says, in the examples from New Testament scriptures, believers were baptized into a union with Christ. And we see this from Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 3 through 5. They were baptized into the possession of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's what Matthew chapter 28 teaches at verses 18 and 19. Just as the Israelites were saved from the Egyptians the day they crossed the Red Sea, Exodus 14, 30, the lost sinner is saved by his obedience to Christ when he crosses into the water of baptism. His obedience to Christ's will is an act of faith in the cross of Christ. There, it, there is a design and purpose for immersion into Jesus, which numerous passages in the New Testament share with us, uh, namely Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. We have Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. And this just uh, is a few of them. And so I thought that was very pertinent to go with what we read here regarding this idea of being baptized into Moses, the cloud and the sea there from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse uh, 2. <clears throat> There's a contrast that we see, though, in verse 5. When we see all these blessings in verses 1 through 4, uh, all the things that all the people shared in, uh, we read we read here that God was displeased. He was not well pleased by most of them. And so that word most does stand in contrast to the word all, which is seen five times in those first four verses there. And so there were a lot of people doing things of their own will that God was not happy, uh, not happy about. And... Uh, <clears throat> Why is it that God was not pleased with them? You know, there is a reason why God's uh, uh, ire is seen. His, his wrath was displayed. There is a reason why uh, God has a huge displeasure with, uh, with evil. And what it really boils down to is that God has an intolerance for sin. He doesn't tolerate it. You know, he's, he, he's very clear about how we are to act, how we are to react in various situations. I read a <clears throat> post <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> a couple of days ago, and I really liked what it had to share. And it was talking about somebody walking along with a full coffee cup. And <laughs> Nanny's not feeling well. She's not here, but, uh, you know, she's having sight issues. She's uh, poured milk on her cereal, and she says, oh, my goodness, I got that full. And, I mean, she picked it up, and immediately it spilled out because that's how full it was. So this person's walking along with a full coffee cup and gets bumped. And the person says, man, you caused me to spill my coffee. Actually, No. I didn't cause you to spill your coffee. Coffee was in it, which was then spilled. What if you had tea in there? That would have been what spilled. The point is, what we fill our cup with is what's going to spill out when we're faced with a difficult situation. If we fill our cup with anger and uh, 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 divisiveness, if we fill our cup with uh, vindictiveness, 
when we're in those situations, that's what's going to spill out. But if we fill our cup with things like joy and peace and the love of God and, and His truth, and, and you see what I'm getting at? God hates evil. He just, He doesn't tolerate sin. And so He says here, we should not be craving evil things. Uh, we should not lust after. There's three, these three words, should not and lust. Should gives the idea of exist, okay? Uh, should this, should that, you know, it, there's an existence of something. The word not here, though, it can, because of the way the Greek writes it, it is absolute denial. And then, of course, lust, which the American Standard Version, version which I use, translates uh, uh, crave interchangeable. When you lust after something, you crave something, you know, you yearn for something, you know. And so what he says here is that we, there, sh there, there should absolutely not exist any craving within us for evil things. In the context here, idolatry, you know, and, and that's the idea here. But what, what was it that they, they craved? You know, uh, verse seven, it were, it's not just idolatry, but it's the activities involved in idolatry. In this case, what are they doing? Eating, drinking, dancing, basically carousing. You know, at the, at the foot of Sinai, which this is referring to, Moses is up there. He's getting instruction uh, from the hand of God being written upon those stones, right? And what are they doing? They're at the foot of the mountain having a party. It just doesn't work that way. It's, it just, it's just not right. Um, so what are the associative behaviors of idolatry? Verses 8, 9, and 10 tell us this. They were acting immorally. Uh, we see the result of what their immoral behavior was. Uh, they were also involved in trying the Lord. I'm going to test God today. It just, just saying that is scary, right? Why is it scary? Well, let's see. He created the world. You know, he speaks and things come into existence. And, and we need to know this because evolution teaches that, that everything we see started from a, a mass of something. There was something there at the very, very beginning that was acted upon, which gives us the universes and earth and flowers, trees, and bugs. Okay? Um, but what Scripture teaches is that God spoke and from nothing. Things were created. Is it really a wise thing to test God? Uh, not in a lot of ways that we want to do that, or we might do that. Um, one more there, you know, in, in verse 10. Um, grumble as some of them did. This is the whining passage. Why do we have to eat this? I'm tired of all the manna. I want something else. They were given quail and ate so much of it they got sick. Right? So, yeah, those are, those are the associative behaviors, I guess you could say, of idolatry. And then, of course, the lessons that are learned are uh, seen in verses 11 uh, and following. So verse 11 says, we need to look back on this. History is there for a reason. History is there for a reason. Let's repeat what is good, right? And let's not repeat what should not be repeated. You, you can't repeat the same thing from the past and then expect to get a different result. It just doesn't work. It does not work. So he says, be wary in verse 12. Be wary. 
I mean, we can have confidence in things. First John, First uh, John five thirteen, it says, "These things were written so that you may know you have eternal life." Now, there's a confidence there, but what's the context, right? Let's be confident in that. And I I want to even use that as an example in testing God. Because I think maybe there are some times. God, you have promised. Romans 10, 17 is is another example of testing God. I do this. I, I do this. God, you have promised something as a result of that passage. So when I share God's word with somebody, I am, I, I, I know it's kind of a, I, I don't want it to be overconfident. It's not, I don't want you to get that idea. And I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm being disrespectful. Um, but I'm testing God in that situation. I think, I think it's okay there. In what these people were doing in chapter 10, no, it's not. It's not right. You can't test God and behave in a sinful way and still expect God to provide redemption. 23,000 people lost their lives because of their involvement in what God does not tolerate. You can't test God in that manner and expect to get by on his good side. But when passages like John shares in 1 John chapter 5, I can know that I am redeemed. I can know that I have eternal life. I can know those things intellectually, and not base my salvation on a feeling, oh, I feel I'm in a good place. That ain't a good place to be. God has prompt, God has given us something better than that for us to be able to count on. Amen? Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's, let's look at some more things here. He says there, of course, in verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you. Thank God that and, and, and what he says in this passage is that temptation is common. There is no way that anybody on earth can say, okay, today I'm going to go to a place where I don't have to deal with temptation. All right? It might take me away from one thing that tempts me, but there's going to be something else right here. Right? Right? Temptation is is a common thing, and God has given us a promise in this passage. He has given us encouragement. He doesn't say he's going to take it away. doesn't do that. But in effect, it does escape us. It is removed, because if we place our trust in God and the methods by which we are able to deal with temptation, we can phone a friend, right? We we can go to whatever uh, source that Scripture has for us dealing with temptation. Here's a challenge for you this week, okay? Here's some homework, all right? Uh, and, And so tomorrow morning when you wake up for your coffee and you're getting ready to start your day, ask yourself this question. What are three things, write them down, what are three ways that God helps me to deal with temptation? All right? Put it on a three-by-five card or whatever, you know? Use an ink pen on your hand. It's not permanent. It'll fade away, but it'll last long enough that when you look at that, you've got three things, three things, three things. They're going to fade away, but they're going to stick air. Uh, that, that might be some good homework. So let's look at some New Testament incentive. This is in verses 14 through 22. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. 
I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we, were, for we are all uh, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharing in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and partake of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We're not stronger than he, are we? It goes back to that argument about God being the creator and we're not. You know, but because of these above, these, these, uh, examples that we have just looked at in the first part of this passage, whether it's, you know, you know, the, the, those things that displease God, the craving of, uh, of wrong things, the, uh, uh, just the presence of evil, you know, he says, flee. There should be a parent, uh, a parentheses, uh, behind that. Thayer's Greek defines this this way, to flee, seek safety by flight. Metaphorically, to flee, to shun, to avoid by flight, something abhorrent, especially vices. To be saved by flight, to escape safely out of danger. Poetically, to flee away, to vanish. It should be noted that the Greek writes this word in the present imperative. What that means is, right now is the present. It is imperative. It is a must-do. It is. It, there is no gray area. Ten minutes from now, it is going to be present. It is going to be imperative. A must-do. No gray area. So when we have all of this stuff that comes before us, we need to be just like God and not tolerate sin. When that temptation comes before us, then is the present imperative. Run away. That's why the word flee in this passage, should have an exclamation point behind it. Because it really should. Um, <clears throat> he says that we need to be wise. You know, people say that we're not supposed to judge. Well, let's be careful. There are, there are a number of places Scripture tells us, you need to judge. And this is one of them. How can we know what temptation is if we are incapable of judging between what's right and what's wrong? This world is absolutely lost in that shadow because this person says this is right. This person says, no, that isn't, but this is right. This person says, well, this is wrong. This person says, uh-uh. You see what I'm getting at? Only God can tell us what's good and what's bad. And I find it interesting, the etymology of the word good cannot exist apart from the existence of the word God, because the word good comes from God. There isn't anybody on this earth that can use the word good and not... even unconsciously... Reference God. But again, they're not doing so correctly if they say something is good when God has already said it ain't. Um, that's why we find that idols here are defined as demons. And I don't, I don't, I don't care if the religion out in the world, because there are, we've talked about this, uh, 
I was raised in religion. They'll tell you they don't do idols, but they do icons. They do a lot of icons, and there ain't no difference. Absolutely none. It's demonic. It's wrong. There's one God. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Let's look at the last part of our section uh, today. And, and, and actually, I think this, this section of Scripture, beginning of verse 23, ends with chapter 11, verse 1. Um, and we, and why do I say that? You know, chapter 11 is different from chapter 10. Well, <clears throat> we have to keep in mind that the, when these were first written, we didn't have the, all the numbers, the, 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 the chapter separations and the verse, uh, numbers. They weren't, they weren't there. They were added later by scribes to ensure that when they were copying the letters that Paul and others, uh, passed around, that they made sure that what was copied uh, was exact, and so they they separated them into chapters, and they made sure when 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 they added numbers to uh, Paul's letter, say First uh, First Corinthians. Uh, okay, so this this letter we're going to separate into sixteen chapters. All right, so when it was copied, the letter that was then going to be added or mailed out or sent for further copying, it also had six, uh, 16 chapters. You know, that chapter 10 had 33 verses. You know, so they'd count the letters, they'd count the words, they'd count the verses, and they made sure uh, uh, to maintain an accuracy. That's one of the reasons why we can trust what we have is what God wants us to have. Okay, so I think that it ends here in uh, verse 1 of chapter 11. Let's begin in verse 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that's sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you wish to go, eat anything that's set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone should say to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols. Don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the conscience sake. I mean, not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, that they may be saved, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. This is, I think this is a section of Scripture that's really, uh, it's, it's really plain. I think that it's easy enough for, for us to grasp all things, because it, when it comes to the, the first few verse, verses here, 23, and, uh, you know, there, you know, verse 23 is basically saying that uh, all things can be expedient, we can involve ourselves in all things. Uh, we're free uh, to do this, you know. Why should uh, somebody uh, slander me, you know, he says here. Um, Christians are free to do anything they please as long as that which they are doing is not sinful, okay? However, that said, I might be free to do something, but if I, if what I choose to do is going to harm the spirituality uh, of another brother or sister in Christ, I may want to rethink that. I, I, I'm, I may want to, uh, uh, consider other options. You know what I'm saying? Um, because he's pointing out here. Don't seek your own good, but that of your neighbor. This passage really puts our whole existence into a life of servitude. It really does. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul said in the Roman letter, we're going to be slaves to somebody. We're either, we, we, I mean, we can either be slaves to, to the devil, we can be slaves to God. If I'm going to be a slave to God, nothing wrong with that at all. That at all. Uh, pierce my ear, O Lord. 
uh, my God, as we sing that song. Take me to your doorpost this day, right? I, I will gladly uh, serve in your house for the rest of my days. But this just adds kind of a different perspective to it. Um, even, even in the... Uh, I started to share an illustration that may not have been appropriate from the pulpit. Um, ask me later about this illustration. Um, I'll share then. Uh, let's just let's just let's just leave it at that because that just that is just a huge question. Um, there are things that I like to drink that are not alcoholic. Because I don't do alcohol. I am, I am a recovering alcoholic. All right. 40 years it's been. Don't want to have any lapses there. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I don't do alcohol, but somebody may get the idea that what I'm drinking is alcoholic. All right. Now, if this individual is a new brother or sister in Christ, they say, Hey, you know, should you really be drinking that? And, and uh, I don't even have to ask the question. I don't even have to make any other statement. All I have to say is, hey, if this is a concern, um, I'm, it's not alcoholic, but I will not touch that again. That's the idea here, you know, because I don't want their relationship with Christ to be stunted uh, by anything that I may do. I am a servant to them. Um, and that's one of the things that Paul is saying here. And so in verse 32, he says, Give no offense to anybody, Jew, Greek, whoever, the church. You know, when he separates, he, he, there are basically two groups of people here. Okay, well, three. He says, don't offend Jews. Jews are people who have a, uh, an historical background to the existence of God that Gentiles don't. So Paul says, don't offend Jews. He says, don't offend Gentiles. Gentiles are more from a uh, place of idolatry because that's really what he's talking about here. You know, so he says, don't offend idol worshipers. All right. But then he says, don't offend the church. You know, and who's in the church? You have Christians that are mature. He's mentioned that. Because there are Christians who know that God has, God has given us everything. Look at verse 26. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Even that meat that came from an animal that somebody sacrificed to a God which really doesn't exist. Because there's only one God. Mature Christians know this. There's only one God. Always has been, always will be. Um, and so enjoy the barbecue, basically. Give thanks for it. But if that dinner's again going to offend somebody, rethink uh, what you're doing. Paul says, be imitators of me, just as I am of Christ. That is the conclusion. We need to imitate God, right? Imitate each other other as you see God and Christ working in that individual. Uh, I mentioned in class, though, today that there have been times when I have regretted teaching some things because of how they made somebody feel, and I've rethought that since I've done those kinds of things. The point, point here is uh, <clears throat> we need to be forgiving of each other. When our actions and attitudes and behaviors spill out something that is not pretty, you know, uh, Sherry told the granddaughter, don't spill that on my duvet, my brand new bed cover. Chocolate milk is really hard to get out, you know, and, 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 and that's true. When we spill out something that's less than encouraging, it leaves an indelible mark. It really does. And so uh, let's, let's be imitators of really 
good things. Amen? I don't know what you have need of today. If there is a particular concern going on in your life that you're struggling with, and this may be, this is that, that invitation call because we talked about, uh, we talked about, uh, fleeing from temptation. You know, if you're dealing with a temptation that you're having a particular struggle with, this really is one of the ways that God helps us to overcome temptation. And, and it has to do with the commonality. You know, you're dealing with temptation. I deal with temptation. You know, we can put our heads and our hearts together and share with how we are able to overcome that uh, particular thing that you're dealing with. Uh, it may be a temptation that you have that maybe it's not something that I particularly struggle with, but maybe somebody else in the congregation does. You know, you don't have to go into great detail about what it is uh, that you're dealing with, but maybe just enough that uh, there's a particular brother or sister in the congregation here can be that encouragement that your soul is crying out for uh, today. So whatever it is that you have need of, come forward, won't you, while we stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.